the use of ultrafiltration for volume management in COVID-19 patients. CHF Solutions is honored to host this educational webinar in an effort to provide valuable insight on treating COVID-19 patients experiencing volume overload. All participants will be in listen-only mode. At the conclusion of the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions by submitting them through the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. Participants on this call are advised that the audio of this conference call is being broadcast live over the internet and is also being recorded for playback purposes. A replay of the call and presentation will be available immediately afterward at www.chf-solutions.com under the Investors tab and Events and Presentations tab. During the course of this webinar, the speakers may make forward-looking statements. Except for historical information, statements made by the speakers are forward-looking statements that are made pursuant to the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Forward-looking statements involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that are based on beliefs, assumptions, expectations, and information currently available. Those risks and uncertainties include the risk factors described under the caption risk factors and elsewhere in the company's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. By providing this information, the company undertakes no obligation to update or revise any projections or forward-looking statements, whether as a result of new information, new developments, or otherwise. You should review the cautionary statements and discussion of risk factors including the company's press release relating to this webinar, the company's latest 10K, subsequent reports, as well as other filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission under the titles risk factors or cautionary statements related to forward-looking statements or additional discussion of risk factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from current expectations. Those discussions regarding risk factors, as well as the discussion of forward-looking statements in such sections, are incorporated by reference in this call and are readily, readily available on the company's website at www.chf-solutions.com. Today's webinar will be moderated by Dr. Amir Kansori. Dr. Kazori is Professor of Medicine and Vice Chief of Clinical Affairs in the Division of Nephrology, Hypertension, and Renal Transplantation at the University of Florida. He has been involved in clinical research projects, including those related to extracorporeal and pharmacological therapies that are currently offered to patients with cardiorenal and other disorders of water, hemostasis, and congestive states. He regularly provides talks on these topics at various national and international conferences. I would now like to turn the call over to Dr. Fazori, who will introduce the webinar panelists. Thank you very much for your introduction. Hello, everybody. I am Amir Kazori. Um, in the great scheme of coronavirus pandemic, the purpose of this webinar is to discuss the various clinical aspects of fluid management in patients with COVID-19. It is my pleasure to have two of my colleagues here with me participating today in this webinar. I will ask them to introduce themselves. Dr. DeVita, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Maria DeVita. I'm the Chief of Nephrology at Lenox Hill Hospital in uh, New York City, New York. Welcome, everybody. Hi, Dr. Olumi. Hi, this is Mehdi Olumi. I'm a medical director of the City Surgery in Mount Sinai, New York. Perfect. Well, the webinar is composed of three sections. We start by providing an overview of the COVID-19, how long is involved in it, ARDS, and what are the general aspects of its therapy, which includes um, fluid resuscitation. 
We then move on to the second part and talk more about the importance of maintaining fluid balance in these patients, the risk of volume overload, and its consequences. We also discuss the available options for treatment of congestion in these patients. At the end, in the third section, we provide an overview of isolated ultrafiltration as an option for fluid removal, how it is applied in real world, the evidence behind its use, and hopefully we will have some time to talk about practical aspects and tips. So for the first part, let me start by the first question from Dr. Olumi. Dr. Olumi, what are the main characteristics of lung involvement in COVID-19? Thank you. If I have a slide one, I appreciate it. Sure. As you may know, WHO came with a guideline regarding regard of the clinical management of the severe acute respiratory infection with COVID-19 um, suspected patient, which is the RAS revised was on March 13. Today, I'll emphasize, as you mentioned, it would be determined the effect of the volume overload in the severe ARDS patient and the role of the ultrafiltration. Next slide. As you know, the clinical presentation of the 19 is a wide spectrum. Majority of the case, they are going to be asymptomatic. However, clinical presentation in hospitalized patients is pneumonia with symptoms of the fever, cough, shortness of breath, and fatigue and myalgia. In order of the occurrence, there's a temperature in the course of the disease under pneumonia is something around 85 to 90 percent is going to happen less with cough around 75%, shortness of the breath is around 65 to 70%, and the fatigue and myalgia, which is severe in some form, is around less than 50% of the case. Fortunately, pneumonia can progress to the acute respiratory distress syndrome, with the main pathology is gonna be a diffuse and damage in 17 to 29% uh, of the case. That's the reason is going to be a pressure on the hospital, particularly in intensive care units, which a good percentage of this patient will develop the sepsis, septic shock, and the multi-organ failure. It's a difference between the presentation of the COVID-19 with the manifestation of the H1N1, which we had around late 2007 to 8. Next slide, please. If you see, it's not the, we don't have a risk factor modeling for who is going to develop the COVID-19. But so far, what we know is, if the patient, they are older age group, if they have a cardiovascular disease, the last CDC mentioned is around 10% of these uh, people that they have. If they have a diabetes mellitus, something around 8%, and then chronic respiratory disease is a four characteristic. If it happened on those patients who get the COVID-19 on this type of the patient, the severity of the disease is going to be significant compared to the general population, which mostly going to be asymptomatic or the mild flu-like syndrome. And next slide, please. So if you see, if you COVID-19, when the patient they come to the intensive care unit, a good percentage of them, they are gonna require the mechanical ventilation for the uh, ARDS that they have. Is this majority of this type of the patient, as I said, is different from the H1N1, then they're gonna have a, some other associated uh, disease or pathogenesis too. They're gonna to have a cardiac injury. There's a report from the China that they have around 25% of them, they have a form of the cardiomyopathy, particularly in the elderly. They're gonna develop the sepsis and the septic shock. They're gonna you know, develop the acute kidney injury. It's a good percentage, they're gonna require the renal replacement therapy. 
and then multi-organ failure. However, the percentage of them, if you see when they come to the intensive care unit, they require the high flow oxygen, which they need to be in the isolated room and negative pressure room, because it's gonna be aerosolized nowadays. And then on top of it, group of them, they are gonna recover, group of them, they are gonna go again, require the mechanical ventilation. What I wanna conclude from this slide is the COVID-19 uh, is going to present as a single organ failure with the ARDS that we used to see it, and then usually they have a better or, uh, outcome compared to the ARDS with other comorbid disease or associated pathogenesis is going to be the minority of the case. Last slide, please. So I just want to emphasize that through our experience that we had it, and we, I personally deal with lots of the cardiac surgery patients because this COVID patient series of them, they are going to end up with the extracorporeal management. What we know it and we emphasize it, particularly in our center, and we try to send a message out, if you look at the, on the group of the patient who have a cardiovascular disease and the some form of the therapy or assist device they need it, what's the most important characteristic for us is the center of municipal pressure. And the several study has been shown. I just bring one of these slides for this particular webinar that emphasizes that the significance of the volume overload, particularly when the patient, they get to multi-organ failure, including the right heart failure is one of the parameters we emphasize as significantly. On top of it, we usually asking, because we are in center that we are gonna get the referral through our system for the uh, ECMO or through the VV ECMO or VA ECMO, is that one of the parameters that before the transfer that be sure that the patient as much as possible to manage the volume of the patient before they transfer to us to beat uh, central municipal pressure at least less than eight. I just want to reemphasize this one in the situation that significant of the, you know, hopefully we're going to discuss it more, significance of the volume assessment. And hopefully we are going to get it uh, later on what's going to probably determine the outcome of the patient, at least one of the mo most important parameters. Thank you. Great. Thank you so very much, Mehdi, for this interesting overview of the COVID-19. I wanted to ask you about the general principles for treatment of these patients, but you covered that, um, talking about oxygenation, possibly, probably some of these patients would need ECMO, and also fluid resuscitation for hemodynamic stabilization. Now that we have this um, great background on COVID-19, how it affects the respiratory system, its role in development of ARDS specifically, and the role of fluid resuscitation in addition to other supportive measures such as oxygenation that Dr. Olumi um, just um, described, let's move on to the second section of the webinar. In this part, we focus on the importance of fluid balance and the role that it can have to preserve renal hemodynamics and function. So Dr. DeVito, what are your thoughts on the importance of maintaining fluid balance in critically ill patients? Well, that's our major objective. You really need to um, maintain the good balance. Um, the difficult part is that many patients, when they present to a critical care unit or present critically ill, actually need fluids, um, and then can very quickly, we can pass the mark and maybe fluid overload them as they um, have deteriorations of the either single organ or multiple organs, as Dr. Lumre had um, elucidated just a moment ago. If you have too much volume, then you get congestion. Uh, congestion can take the form of cerebral edema, certainly pulmonary edema, which all clinicians are very aware of. Then you have increased venous pressure, then that can lead to a backup of renal interstitial edema, tissue edema, impaired lymphatic drainage. You can see how you just get total body fluid overload and then poor functioning of the system because there's just too much congestion. 
there is very known interactions between the heart and the, and the kidneys. We call those cardiorenal or renal cardio syndromes. So you're getting a backup. So the difficult part is um, definitely trying to give them the fluid, but knowing when to tap the brakes a little bit to then start pulling back on the rate of fluid resuscitation and then maybe even getting rid of fluid. On top of this, you can just have inflammation, and then inflammation will just cause congestion in and of itself. Um, as you can see on the slide that Dr. Kazori just put up for us, um, we talk about these bi-directional pathways that will link everything between the heart failure and the renal dysfunction. So as you have worsening kidney dysfunction, you're going to have um, decreased fluid removal, then that will lead to increased fluid overload, which then leads to heart failure. Heart failure will do the same thing if you want to start there that if the heart's not uh, generating an appropriate cardiac output, then you're not getting enough fluid into the kidney to then have the kidney remove the fluid in the form of, of urine output. So it's a very delicate balance um, that we have to maintain. And I just want to emphasize that most of these conditions, uh, the other two um, participants can sort of um, give me their opinions, but most of the time we have to give fluid when you have the ARDS and then when to stop um, to make sure we don't exceed the pulmonary wedge pressures that are tolerable um, is the key. Um, and that's where either diuresis or the um, ultrafiltration may be very useful. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I wanted to ask this question from both of you. I just wanted to know your thoughts in general, how we are treating volume overload to restore fluid balance. Maybe I start with Dr. Olumi. In the ICU setting, what are the options that uh, we have to, to treat volume overload in these patients, knowing that, as Dr. DeVita was mentioning, some of these patients will need fluid for hemodynamic stabilization, but the issue is that the majority of the time we move a little bit more than what we need, and the patients will at some point find himself with some degree of congestion. What would be the options to treat that? Um, as of right now, lots of the centers have started diureting. But what uh, I want to emphasize is because part of my research during the fellowship was the ARDS. Uh, if you see in the ARDS, as Dr. Devita mentioning it, ARDS is a good component. If you get it too much of the volume, then you're going to have a long congestion too, and gas exchange does not happen very fast. So it means the prediction from as soon as the patient goes on the, let's say, uh, support, ventilator, ECMO, all the, all the time, we need a reliable uh, resource of the volume management. What it means, it, historically, usually we wait, patient gets volume overload, and then we start a diuretics, and they'll see if the patient is responsive, yes or no, good percentage of them, they might not be responsive. What we traditionally be starting to doing it around the last decade or so, and we think our result has been uh, significantly improvement, is that as soon as the patient comes with a multi-organ failure, the patient mandatory intake might be more than 100 to 150 cc. So it means about the same time we look at the emergency of the how we are going to fluidly manage the patient at the time. Yes, we are going to minimize it. We might start a diuretics but very fast as a kind of emergency treatment, the same way we optimize the oxygenation, we try to assess the volume overload. And if the patient is volume overloaded, we are very aggressively to use the use of the ultrafiltration. Perfect. Thank you very much. Dr. Um, DeVita, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, add more of an overview. The way I look at it is uh, I think we definitely want to keep the balance. We want to go ahead and uh, use diuretics as best we can. And then as a nephrologist, I have my uh, hemodialysis equipment. I have my CVVH equipment. I have my ultrafiltration equipment. And I think of them as just as a continuum. What do I need to fix right now in this patient? Um, if I need some clearances, so if I have to, if they're accumulating uremic toxins or potassium or becoming acidotic, then I do want to do some sort of therapy that has both uh, convective and conductive 
um, treatments, but if it's just a pure volume issue, then you want to do something uh, pure ultrafiltration. With my hemodialysis equipment, that's going to be a slow, continuous ultrafiltration, a scuff we call that, or just with an aquadex, it's going to be an ultrafiltration, or with a diuretic, it's going to be a diuresis. So I have all these tools that I can use, and I think um, we really just want to keep the flow going, like Dr. Aluma said. So I just sort of look at the patient and say, what do I need to fix now, and what tool do I have? And I feel very comfortable just using them at a continuum, and I think it's a, a nice way to think about it. Perfect. So I just want to add um, to um, what was um, already said um, that um, me working in the cardiovascular ward as a nephrologist, uh, one specific um, uh, characteristic of patients with heart failure that come with congestion is that volume overload is actually the driver of adverse outcomes. As you very well know, in the past, we always thought that if we preserve renal function, it would be better than pushing for fluid extraction. Recent studies showed that if we have to decide between the two, probably fluid overload or volume overload might be a better target because that one is the driver of outcomes. We had a, um, and it has been seen in different settings. It's not only in heart failure. Just like in this study, the intraoperative fluid balance, if we have more fluid given to the patient during operation, it is associated with worse outcomes. It is in different settings, and as Dr. Devita was mentioning, because it has effects on several um, uh, different organs, the kidney being one of them. So, well, now that we know more about um, the detrimental effects of volume overload on various organs, and also the limitations of diuretic therapy in this setting, Let's move on to the third section of this webinar and talk more about mechanical fluid removal, that we also call it ultrafiltration, and evaluate its role and utility for critically ill patients who become volume overloaded, the type of COVID-19 that is the focus of this discussion today. I want to start the first question with Dr. DeVita, who is a nephrologist, and ask her um, what um, she would, um, she would, how does she define ultrafiltration as compared to other forms of renal replacement therapy, or now these days we call them renal support, such as hemodialysis or hemofiltration. What is different um, uh, from hemodialysis or hemofiltration that ultrafiltration is offering? Great, thank you. So the ultrafiltration will just be the removal of plasma water, um, and it um, doesn't clean the blood, so you don't get any diffusion of any um, collected particles um, uh, as you would in someone who's uremic. So ultrafiltration is just the movement of plasma water across the semipermeable membrane. It can be done with a very low blood flow rate and um, has a very simple machine. You can also do straight ultrafiltration with my other dialysis equipment, um, but a straight ultrafiltration machine is pretty simple to operate. Then we have our CVVH equipment, um, and then that can be uh, that's usually a slow dialysis where you run the blood through a filter and there's dialysate on the other side, so you're also going to get some diffusion of molecules. You can co correct hyperkalemia, correct acidosis, correct uremia by doing um, dialysis. Um, that's also done with somewhat of a slower rate compared to traditional intermittent hemodialysis in that the dialysate is running much more slowly. And then you have your traditional hemodialysis, which is just a really rapid shift of fluid and electrolytes. The typical hemodialysis can run anywhere from you know, two to four or five hours. Longer than that, it's still a dialysis, but we call that SLED. It's just um, terminology based upon the, the length of the treatment. Uh, you can do CVVHD, which would be, again, the slower continuous, that would be a 24-hour plus operation, but you can mix and match these things now. So it's, again, what I was saying before, it's what do I need to fix now? How much clearance do I need? Then I would do something with dialysis, and that would be CVVHD or an intermittent hemodialysis, or do I need ultrafiltration? Well, the equipment can do isolated ultrafiltration, um, but I look at the simplicity of um, 
the, um, the the isolated ultrafiltration equipment um, in these oh. situations when I just want to remove fluid. Excellent, perfect. Dr. Olumi, in your opinion, what do you see as benefit of ultrafiltration in treating volume overloaded patients in the ICU setting? Um, there's a few things we're seeing. It. One is uh, easily accessible. So it means we, um, we put a time from the when we ordering it and then we hook it to the patient to address, as you said, the volume the status of the patient is going to be pretty fast. So usually, as I said, the prediction when is high, the ease of the usage and the timing that we needed to start it. So that's the reason the sequence of the event. However, I agree with you, Dr. DeVita, if the patient has any acid base balance, it usually taking by time, not necessarily all the patient at the beginning they have it, uh, then we need the other form of the uh, renal uh, supplement. So easy of the usage, secondly, is being able to order by the uh, all their staff, but I mean it by the intensivist, uh, or other uh, member, particularly work in the cardiac surgery after discussion with the surgeon. Uh, so that's, those are the main consideration and the prediction that we see which way the patient is going on. So we usually we don't wait till the patient get hypervolemic and we address the issue, as you mentioned, and get, try to address the issue from beginning. Perfect. I want Can to I make add- one other... Oh, oh, please go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, so I just wanted to make one other distinction in terms of the rates. Um, for traditional dialysis, the blood flow rates, the rate at which the blood flow goes through the circuit is upwards of 400 mill or about 400 milliliters in a minute, and the dialysate is running at 500 milliliters a minute, so it's very rapid. For CVVHD, your blood flow rate can be as low as 150 or 200 milliliters a minute up to the traditional 400, but your dialysate's only running at two or three or four liters an hour. Very, very slow. And then the ultrafiltration, um, isolated ultrafiltration, your blood flow rates are very low. It's 10 to 40 milliliters a minute, um, and you can do ultrafil- ultrafiltration rates from you know 10 to 500 milliliters in an hour. So just to let you, uh, the listeners, be aware of the magnitude difference on, on how we can on how these different uh, pieces of equipment run. Thank you very much, Mario. Actually, we are coming back to this a little bit uh, later. I also want okay, to add a point in the ICU setting that ultrafiltration I have noticed um, is quite helpful and popular for the intensivist is that it has some predictability to it. When you are using diuretics, some patients um, uh, respond very well, some patients less, and some of them are diuretic refractory, as we call it, right? But in the ICU setting, you might want to have a plan very rapidly. So predictability of removal of fluid is an advantage of ultrafiltration. Unfortunately, with diuretics, we know that there is a dose response um, uh, curve that is very variable among patients, and then it makes it a little bit more difficult to use within um, certain short um, um, time periods as we do in the ICU setting. And to just elaborate on that point, I tell my students and my fellows um, that if I need the blood pressure down, I control it, I give a drip. If I need my blood pressure up, I control it, I give a drip. If I need better oxygenation, I control it, I increase the FiO2. This is a way to sort of control the output and uh, exactly that. I don't know when the when the diuretic is going to kick in and for how long. So um, if I need to control it right now, the ultrafiltration definitely adds to that, and I think it's a wonderful tool tool for that specifically. Exactly. Mario, actually now I wanted to um, um, ask you a question. I think you presented your work in the American Society of Nephrology's annual meeting last year in Washington, D.C. on the uses and effectiveness of Aquadex, the portable ultrafiltration device, for treatment of volume um, volume overload in the critical care setting. Would you please elaborate on that a bit for us? Sure. Um, Yeah, it was a nice... um a poster that we had at, at the meeting last fall. And basically at our institution, uh, we use the Aquadex, uh, as I said, if I feel that the person needs fluid off, I use it because it's very easy to set up. And traditionally, or in the past, literature is mostly emphasizing on the use of it 
for congestive heart failure patients to help with their diuresis. And in uh, this study that we did was just a ret retrospective review of the cases we've done. We've done like 23 to 30 cases. We included 23 in this report of just other uses, like why did we use it? And a majority of them were in the cardiothoracic unit, about 15 or 16 of them. And in those patients, it were people who their urine output was just a little bit sluggish. Uh, we didn't feel that they needed dialysis, but we just wanted to get the fluid off more quickly to decongest them, as we're discussing here. We just sort of took, the, took fluid off of them in a very quick way and sort of got them better compensated more quickly than we thought we would have had to otherwise. Um, a few of them were anasarcic post-op, and we just sort of took the fluid off there. A few of them actually were ESRD patients that became a little volume overloaded, usually perioperatively, where we didn't, I didn't want to call in a nurse or I didn't want to set up the whole dialysis equipment, so I just took um, two or three liters off over a set period of time. So I feel uh, in my mindset that this is a very versatile piece of equipment to just get fluid off immediately. Actually, that's a very interesting point because we have the reflex as nephrologists when one of our patients with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis comes to the hospital or is in the hospital and presents with volume overload, we always think about dialyzing them, not thinking that we can use a more simplified version of dialysis machines, the portable ultrafiltration devices, because we only need fluid removal without any clearance. That would be an interesting um, use of such device. Yeah, it's Olumi, done at the nurse yeah. and the critical care nurse will, will use it. I'm sorry, I interrupted. The, you know, so I don't have to utilize one of my hemodialysis nurses because I have a nurse at the, at the critical care bedside that can do that ultrafiltration for me. Sure, absolutely. And the ease of use, we might get back to it a little bit later. Dr. Olumi, do you, um, how do you describe the real-world use of Aquadex uh, in the setting of ICU, if you have something to add? Uh, the, in the setting of the ICU, as you said, is uh, predictability and reliability, especially those who have a history of the uh, kidney injury or cardiorenal syndrome. So it means, as uh, you know, Dr. DeVita says, we are very aggressive as far as the volume removal because we know the role of it, particularly on the right side heart failure that we have. It's a good percentage of our patient because of the pump run or because they already have a cardiomyopathy or have a heart failure. They have a right-sided heart failure and it's gonna be getting the predictable volume removal which is gonna help for the early extubation and the consequent management of them. So to make it in one sentence, it means all the times, as Dr. DeVita, volume status of the patient has to be addressed as aggressively and emergently as possible, particularly in those people who has a uh, multi-organ failure or the vent dependent and the right ventricular uh, uh, right uh, RV failure. Perfect. So um, here, I would like to share with you my thoughts on the use of Aquadex for management of fluid overload. Um, as much as we are discussing here, septic patients who are critically ill in the ICU with volume overload, I think we can learn quite a bit from a, um, I would say, seemingly different patient population. I would like to take a moment and talk about patients with acute decompensated um, heart failure, the patients who come to the hospital for volume overload. The reason I think we need to discuss them here is that, first of all, congestion, that is the focus of our webinar today, is well studied, actually, in these patients. Its negative impact on the outcomes has been established, and now we know that congestion is more than a mere symptom or sign. It actually plays a pathophysiologic role and has a bidirectional um, relationship with both kidney and the heart. So that is the, one of the reason that I, um, reasons I think we need to talk about it. The second point is that since diuretics have long been the standard of therapy for these patients, the shortcomings now have become evident and are well known to those practitioners that are providing care to these patients. And the third reason is that 
Um, and possibly the, the most important point I should say is that we do have several well done clinical studies and randomized controlled trials on the role of ultrafiltration therapy with Aquadex for these patients. So the data that are extracted from these studies could, I would say, potentially be extrapolated to our patients in the ICU who are struggling with consequences and um, complications of volume overload. The studies um, that um, I know of in um, the field of um, heart failure have shown that ultrafiltration can have more efficient and more rapid fluid removal. This is what, what we talked about in the ICU setting a few minutes ago. So compared with medical treatments that are typically based on diuretic use, ultrafiltration can provide us with more efficient fluid control that is predictable as opposed to diuretic therapy. One of the main advantages of ultrafiltration using Aquadex smart flow system is removal of isotonic um, fluid. I am putting it in on this um, slide. So it doesn't change a patient's electrolytes, but since ultrafiltration therapy is indeed a hydrostatic pressure that pushes water with its electrolytes through a semi-permeable membrane, by default, a sodium concentration of ultrafiltrate is the same in serum, like 138, 139. But urine that is generated by diuretics or other agents, by comparison, has much less sodium, typically less than half of what you find in the ultrafiltrate. It is shown in this slide, I guess, very well. Also, Dr. DeVita mentioned very well the low extracorporeal volume has only about 35, 40 milliliter of extracorporeal volume we have with these portable ultrafiltration devices, which um, in patients that are unstable is quite helpful. Also, the lower blood flow, again, Dr. DeVita mentioned this, it's around 20 to 40 milliliter um, per minute compared to 150 to 450 milliliter per minute, depending on the modality in various um, settings for the other modalities of renal replacement therapy. So when you put all of these together, it kind of makes sense to, to try to use it because it has advantages compared to our conventional uh, options that we have. Dr. Ulumi, here I would like to talk a bit more about practical aspects of ultrafiltration therapy and would like to ask you about training and personnel that is required to quickly implement access to ultrafiltration. How easy do you find it? Do you have a specific case in mind you want to share with us your experience? Sure. Uh, uh, first of all, you know, BS started a long time ago and then, uh, believe it or not, they put a timing as far as the ordering and the aquadex. And then, uh, believe it or not, we come to about five minutes between the ordering and the running. Second thing I want to emphasize, we have, a, like in most of the other healthcare system, we have a turnover of the new nursing, which the part of the learning of it, we're looking at it, is less than half an hour. So we're quite confident that we can use it. As far as the example, I can tell you just last two weeks, those are the real happen in our unit. One was have a patient on body by ventricular assist device, and then we try to use a CVVH, but because the cannula in the right atrium just sitting on top of the shyly access, whenever we try to hook it to the CVVH, patient is starting to have a, a, we, our pump chattering a lot. So we put the patient on the CHF solution, with the notion we removing it roughly within a matter of three days, total negative 12 liters. Consequently, we decanulate the RVAD, and then the next day we extubate the patient. On the other hand, we had another gentleman we had with the end stage renal disease during the aortic valve surgery required a lot of the volume. And when the patient came out of the unit, we put up access for a patient, and from time, as soon as the patient gets to the intensive care unit, 
within the next day, we were around 500 cc net negative, which is usually very uncommon. When the patient come to the ICU, as you said, the mandatory intake on them might be a 100 to 150 cc. As much as you want to concentrate, then we'll be able to remove it. So go back to the question that you say it. Easy of the access is very important uh, for us. Second thing is going to be easy of the usage for the nursing, particularly the new trained nurse that they are how familiarized with this machine and they're using it. And then, as you say, the predictability is very common. And I just give you a two examples just happened last 10 days, believe it or not, in our units. Perfect. Thank you so very much. Dr. DeVita, would you like to add anything here? Um, I think you summarized that very well. I, I think it was nice that you used it in one of your ESRD patients, and I think the time to start uh, the Aquidex uh, is much shorter than, um, than with the other pieces of equipment. It just takes longer to mobilize it, to prime it, and I think uh, when time is of the essence, uh, I'd like to emphasize that when time is of the essence, this is a very good uh, tool to use. <clears throat> Excellent. So um, thank you so very much. Uh, as you're getting close to the end of the webinar, um, I would like to mention a few take-home messages, and then I will ask my colleagues to add um, what they think would be important to remember. The first point I want to emphasize is that similar to other forms of critical illnesses, fluid stewardship is very important in patients with COVID-19 who are admitted to the hospital. I think we all agree on that. The second point is that some of these patients will have hemodynamic instability and um, the need for fluid resuscitation is there. So they are at risk of developing volume overload and ARDS as well as other complications of progressive congestion. The third point I want to mention here is that volume overload can also contribute to renal dysfunction such uh, and other organs, but including renal dysfunction, which further compromises the ability of these patients for fluid excretion. This would kind of create a vicious cycle. The fourth point that I want to mention is that slow continuous ultrafiltration is an option for efficient fluid excretion, rapid um, decongestion, and um, a way to optimize volume status of these patients in a predictable way, which is the essence of um, therapy in patients in the ICU. Finally, these portable devices, such as Aquadex FlexFlow, have a number of advantages over conventional renal replacement therapies in this setting, such as ease of use. We talked about it quite a bit here, and we, we heard the examples of, uh, that my colleagues offered, like possibility of using peripheral access or the timing between ordering the therapy and the initiation of therapy. Um, for those patients who develop hemodynamic instability, what is important is that we have a very low extracorporeal volume of about 30 to 40 milliliter, they say 35, and low blood flow rate of as low as 20 to 40 milliliter per minute that is not achievable with conventional dialysis machines. This can prove quite helpful. So Dr. Olumi, is there anything you want, want to add? No, absolutely right. The only thing I want to add is this um, ARDS on the COVID patient when they require uh, is, this, is the average time they are going to be on the ventilator is going to be prolonged. Uh, and I think part of it is the be vigilant to address the issue of the hypervolemia on the beginning is very important instead to wait to see because as just you mentioned it and Dr. Davita. The volume management is a kind of the urgent, or I call it honestly emergent, because it's going to improve the gas exchange. It's going to reduce for the, the uh, reduce the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, hepatic uh, congestion, uh, and it's going to be um, helping uh, for the uh, volume management as far as the RV failure. So I think, as you said, is is the predictability of this machine is going to help to address the issue from beginning. Perfect. Dr. DeVita, is there anything you might want to add? 
to just follow that thought along, I think the the thought process hour by hour is that I might need a, a certain amount of urine output or ultrafiltration for hour one, but at hour two, I may want to increase that. Hour three, I may want to decrease it. So the fact that you have complete control hour by hour, uh, I just want to emphasize that. It's not like we're talking all day, what are we doing? But the fact that I can fiddle with it as my needs are is very advantageous. Absolutely. That, that's a great point. Well, thank you very much. With these um, uh, remarks, we are um, reaching the end of this webinar. I would like to again thank my colleagues who accompanied me here, Dr. Maria De Vita and Dr. Mehdi Olumi, and also thank CHF Solutions for sponsoring this program. On behalf of my colleagues, I would also like to thank you all for being with us today. I hope you and your families will stay safe. Thank you. Dr. Gazori, thank you very much. And Dr. David and Dr. Lumi, thank you as well. Um, I would like to remind our, uh, our attendees that you may ask a question by using the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, please select all participants when you are first before you submit your question. And there is one question currently in the queue. Um, the question is, has Aquadex been used yet on any, act, on any actual COVID-19 patients? Dr. Olumi, I think you uh, wanted to comment on that or you made a comment already on that. Uh, I personally don't use it, but um, I, as of right now, we might consider for one patient. Okay, as the cases are starting to grow, unfortunately, in the United States, right? Uh, that, that's, that's, I'm 100% sure is going to come up. Sure. Thank you very much. William, do you see any other questions? I don't see them on my screen. I do not see any other questions at this point. Okay. Well, with this, I would like to thank everybody again. I hope you all stay safe. Um, we'll see you next time in a future webinar, hopefully. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.